Hi, everyone. So thank you for joining us for today's webinar about design pattern and test automation. That was also one of your favorite articles in our blog. We have here with us the expert Anand Bagmar, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. Anand is a software quality evangelist with more than 20 years of experience in the software testing field. He's also a contributor on the Selenium project, writes uh, testing blogs, and has a built open source tools related to software testing. Uh, so before we'll start a few housekeeping, uh, by the end of the event, you will all receive through your email a recording of the webinar, a cool certificate for those of you who will attend the entire session, and make sure to stick till the end uh, when we'll also announce our challenge winner. And please feel free to ask questions in the Q&A section in the Zoom, and we will make sure to address as many of them as possible. And without further ado, I'm happy to hand over the stage to Anand. Thank you so much. Welcome everyone. And I see you are here from various different parts of the world. So thank you very much for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thanks uh, to Test Project to give me this opportunity to share my thoughts and experiences with everyone. Hope you get at least some value out of it, if not uh, a whole lot. Also, I hope to, it's really challenging to talk in front of a monitor without uh, really seeing the expressions of the uh, participants, if you're getting it or not. So I would love to get comments, feedback, uh, and more importantly, while the session is going on, any questions that you might have so that I can try and address those for you, I can try and answer those for you. While we will have a Q&A session at the end, it would be nice to see your uh, questions along the way as well. Okay, so uh, without uh, much ado, let's get started. We'll talk about design patterns and test automation, and here we go. So I'm Anand Bagmar. I've been in the quality space for more than 20 years now, and uh, I've played various different roles uh, along this uh, uh, time span, developer, QA, automation specialist, as that uh, the titles never really mattered to me. It was how could I help build a quality product? and uh, that's what I continue to do today as well. Apart from that, Mithal already mentioned uh, that I'm a um, contributor on the Selenium project. I have open source tools. Uh, you can follow me or reach out to me on uh, LinkedIn or Twitter. And uh, let's get started enough about myself. So the topic today is about design patterns. And I want to start off with a disclaimer, OK? what really is good. We often talk about best practices uh, and I very strongly do not agree with the term best practices. There's nothing like a best practice. It is something that works well in the context of a particular team for that specific problem statement. So there's nothing like really a best. So we are gonna talk about good design patterns. What are the advantages, disadvantages as it applies to test automation? And before we start about patterns, let's really quickly understand what really is a pattern. Again, definition of a pattern, it's a repeated decorative design. And in the context of software engineering, it again means a repeated uh, a design of sorts. You talk about a name of a particular pattern and you don't have to explain how that is really going to work or what kind of problem statements it can solve. I speak about a particular pattern. Uh, if it's a checks pattern. If I'm just talking about design, your design, I know what a checks pattern is or a star pattern is, right? It's a self-explanatory way of explaining what type of implementation is going to be there. And patterns are very popular and very predominant in our software space. Most of the times you would think about patterns when it comes to the development side of things, but guess what? Test automation is also code. Why should it be treated any different than development or product code, right? So patterns are very much applicable in test automation as well. And we will look at some patterns which um, can be applied and add a lot of value from implementing or automating tests as well. So before I get to uh, sh sharing my thoughts around this, here's where you need to interact with me in form of chats, uh, put your comments in chats. What patterns have you come across or used in test automation? I'll wait for 10, 15 seconds. 
let's see if you can type out some answers about patterns that you have used in your automation implementation. Okay, page object model. Okay. Decorator pattern, builder pattern, builder factory singleton. <laughs> I love the answer Jeffrey uh, gave over there. Start coding and hack it till it works. Uh, amazing. Let's see how that scales, Jeffrey. Okay, singleton, pay, uh, form, strategy pattern, state pattern, builder, data driven, app actions, factory picture. Uh, great. So there are a lot of patterns that I'm glad you're talking about. Um, you're aware of a lot of these uh, patterns. And let me quickly just mention a few of these patterns uh, that are very commonly used when it comes to them building test automation uh, frameworks or automating the tests. So of course, yes, page object model, when it comes to test automation, you're driving the functionality of the app. It is very easy to correlate that uh, with what is seen on the screen. And that's where page object model uh, comes out very strongly. And along with that, you never really end up using this in isolation. There are a lot of other patterns that you would use along the way. Uh, it could be singleton, composition, factory, builder, and there are various other patterns that have been mentioned uh, in the chat, right? Uh, uh, Deepak mentioned TDD, that's not really a pattern for implementation, that's test-driven development, so that is different. But Okay, so there are many patterns that are there, right? Uh, what I've listed is definitely not the full list, but these are the ones that you would most commonly use in implementing your tests. So now when it comes to the test automation itself, now let's take some examples to see how you would apply these patterns and how you start building up uh, your uh, implementation, right? Uh, again, referring to what Jeffrey said, hack it till it works. And really, that's how it really starts. And it should start in my opinion, but it should never really end there. You cannot just keep hacking your way and hope it's gonna continue working over a period of time, right? So let's take an example. This is a very old, you know, rather decently old uh, Amazon web page that is there. And as you can see from the screenshot, there are a lot of different components of this web page, okay? Now, if I have to start building automation for this type of a product under test, how would I really go about that? Okay, and this is where we'll switch to code and we'll look at uh, some different examples. Now, again, another disclaimer I should have mentioned earlier, what we will be doing today is we will build up a story around how these patterns can be helpful and what is a desired state in my opinion, where helps you scale seamlessly. So the code examples that I'll show you are reference only. These are snippets of code from my various different experiences that uh, I've come across. Some of this code, unfortunately, have also contributed. And in retrospect, when I look at it, I say, oh, that looks horrible. That looks ugly code. It's not well designed, well architected. Uh, but these are good examples to bear in mind about how you should build your test automation framework. and. Uh, also, what uh, we would, uh, the examples are of various different programming language. We look at Java, JavaScript, Python, Ruby. The point basically that I'm trying to uh, get across over here is the programming language does not really matter. What is important is if you understand a concept you will be able to implement it in the best possible way given the constraints or the functionality available in that programming language. Okay, so that is what we are uh, going to be doing. We will look at uh, these core examples. Now, hopefully you're able to see my screen. What we have over here is an example of how I would typically start writing, uh, implementing a test. The first test that needs to be written, I'm not gonna think about a complex framework or how it needs to be scalable, what other capabilities or features are required as part of it. What I am going to do is I'm gonna quickly hack and implement a simple test. That test, could be as simple as I'm just going to instantiate my driver. I'm going to do some navigations to it. And based on that navigation, I want to make sure that, yes, I've got my basics in place that I can 
instantiate a driver. I can interact with the page and I can do some actions on that. And I know that this basic logic works, okay? So here are some examples from test project, uh, Python examples that are uh, shared. And you just start implementing this, get certain basic validations happening, get some assertions over there. But would I really make this my framework? Definitely not. There is a lot more desired from a test automation framework and we will see uh, how to get to that stage. But this is a very important stage to be in because that's how you will start thinking about, given my past experiences, given the context of the product that I'm testing right now, what type of framework should I be evolving into, which is going to add value to the team, okay? So this is how I typically start off. And as you can see from this example, this is JavaScript as well as um, the Python, it does not really matter what you're doing over here. Okay. Now let's get into the page object pattern. I know that my test automation framework is working or rather my driver is able to interact with my product under test. I now need to scale it up. But now before we get into the page object pattern and how it can help in such type of scenarios, let's look at what really is a page object model. So can you quickly type out what is a page object pattern or page object model? How is it going to help you? Fastest fingers first, come on. Uh, let's see if we can type out some uh, things. What is a page object pattern? Anyone? Okay. Better readability, maintainability, uh, okay, abstraction. Confine all web elements, locators. Reusability, maintainability, divide pages in different classes. Mapping the fields from website into code so you can address them with uh, in a UI test. Everything is as a page object, object identification, separate test functionality in a neat way. That's a very good point uh, from the name. Separate the functionality, uh, similar to abstraction, but uh, more uh, precise uh, and explicit. Uh, we define pages depending on US uh, UI sections, great. Isolation, design, uh, it's a design pattern, okay. Distribution of code, organizes code into pages, great, right? Now, so I think you understand um, what page object pattern is, okay? Great, thanks for those answers. Uh, yes, it's definitely easy to uh, maintain as well and reuse. So here's in a nutshell, what I'm trying to summarize what you have been talking about in chat, right? It helps model your pages in code. How do I really interact with the pages and uh, in form of your test implementations? It helps simulate the user actions. What is the action that I want to do on the page under test? And how do I get the information from that page in order to do uh, assertions or further decisions based on what the state of that particular page is. It will allow you to do that. It allows you to have all the changes or implementation of that page in one single place, which means if anything needs to change about a specific section of the page, it's just a one place change and everyone will be able to reuse that functionality easily. It of course reduces code duplication because that change is not, or rather that no, implementation is not all over the place and the important aspect that you really need to think about over here is that a page object does not mean it's the whole page that is seen on the screen. That is where I've seen a lot of implementation go bad and make it difficult to scale and reuse because you're thinking about the whole page as one single page object instead of thinking of it as logical snippets of pages. So, Let's take an example. We already saw this page earlier. What are the different snippets of pages that you can think about on this particular screen? I could model the search aspect on the page itself as an independent page. There could be a header section, which is an independent page. The ad that is showing up inside the header could be another uh, page itself. 
you've got these uh, gallery or banners which show up, which is a carousal for that matter, right? So that image keeps changing. That could be another page. There are related view uh, items. That is another page. There is individual uh, drop downs in the header. That itself could be another page. And in fact, this is so complex. Each, each of these sections could potentially represent other pages as well. And there is this other section that is there on the right hand side. So this page is extremely complex. It's almost like a single page application, but not really in this case, but it has got a lot of rich functionality. And if I just had to implement tests for the home page, I would still get a lot of value in creating snippets of these pages and interacting with them in that fashion. It will make my code easier to manage. The advantage of this approach is that a lot of these sections of the pages are going to be repeated across various different pages as well. The header in most cases on amazon.com will be replicated across all pages that are there. Search would be there in all page, uh, places. Related items would be there in different pages in slightly different forms. So maybe that is the same or uh, you know, slight variants of it, but you have to understand the product functionality better and use it in that fashion. Okay, so once you think about these snippets, then you can get into the implementation side of it. If you don't think about these uh, snippets, what would happen is, let's look at some examples over here, right? So in this case, if I have some basic structure of the page, but I don't really think about the snippets, you might end up with huge classes. You see this particular class, I think it has got around a thousand lines of code. And this is Ruby, Ruby code is uh, much more compact compared to Java code, for example. So if I had to write the same code in Java, probably two or three times of uh, the number of lines of code uh, in this one class itself. So it can get really complex if you don't think about breaking up the page into smaller snippets. And what is a small enough snippet or manageable snippet? You can evolve your framework to say, I'm going to put it into one class, but as I keep adding more functionality, more types of tests to be implemented, I need to start thinking about reusability and uh, maintainability so I can refactor my code at that point in time as well. You don't necessarily need to identify all page objects beforehand uh, itself. No, you evolve your framework implementation accordingly. So what you would do is you would create a structure like this. You would create partials or based on functionality, you could create a different snippets where you've got implementations, very focused implementations for that snippet. In some cases, the page object can be extremely small which is fine. There is no uh, problem if you have a lot of classes or a lot of page objects created. It is okay, but you know it's a single responsibility principle. Uh, you know if a particular change needs to happen, where do I need to go to make that change? It helps for new team members when they come on board and they need to understand the framework and start using it or uh, updating it. They know which section to go to and make those changes as well. So think about these snippets and evolve into these snippets. That is very, very important. I'm just switching between various different pages because again, these, this code itself is of no value uh, by itself, right? But these are examples about how you can think about these uh, pages. Okay, so I hope this part is clear about now. I've taken my single class where I was instantiating my drivers and everything was happening in that one test itself. I've evolved that into various different uh, classes which are representing my page objects. Of course, there's going to be an aspect of how do I really manage my drivers and control my drivers uh, itself. That could be a separate set of implementation. And now you will start stitching these together to provide and simulate the user actions that you're really looking at that aspect. There's a question that Bob asked, do you, could you think of a page object as a collection of snippets? Absolutely, the home page is a classic example of that, where there's nothing really a, a, like a home page. It is a composition of various different types of snippets of pages, which is providing that functionality for you. Okay, so composition pattern comes into 
uh, picture over here very subtly in very subtle ways that you are looking at how am I going to build this page? I don't want to replicate my header in each and every type of page, a product page or accounts page or anything, right? Header is common across everything. Footer is common across everything. But I have a page called home page, which by itself is nothing but a composition of what are the different snippets that are coming together to allow that interaction or the implementation of functionality. Okay, so this is how your framework really evolves, right? From a single blob of full implementation, you are now starting to think about what is my test? What are the pages? What are the entities or models, which is extremely important again to think about? How do I really want to interact with this page? How do I pass information or get information from the page? Are there any resource files in which I'm either getting data from there or it is about uh, environment configurations? There could be different types of resources that would be required, but you are separating the concerns, making it a single responsibility uh, to allow specifying that information and re reusing it. So this is just a sample of what are the different types of uh, components that could be there in your test framework to build a comprehensive, reusable, scalable, maintainable framework for you. Right? What I've also listed over here in the diagram on the lower uh, left-hand side, if you see the common API or DSL, this is a simple, uh, you want your pages to not worry about, am I interacting at an API level or am I interacting with this at a UI level? Let that common API uh, take care of working with the particular uh, underlying driver to do the interaction. And the page itself is isolated about doing the action on that particular page or getting information from there. How it is really done, it's a matter of even lower detail in a framework implementation. Okay. That said, there are Definitely a lot of limitations of page object pattern. Can you think of any limitations? Again, uh, let's uh, type out. What are the limitations of page object pattern, if any, that you have come across? Can you think of any? Let's look at some answers. Is it going to work in all situations. Okay, there we start seeing uh, the answers. Okay, lot of page classes to maintain. I don't really see that as a limitation. Why is the number of classes a problem if there is a logical structure, how you can get to that particular page? It's a very log it has to be a very logical structure based on how the implementation of the product is. Flaky test on pipelines, how is that related to page object pattern? That's a poor implementation of your tests. Dynamic element selectors, again, not a limitation of page object pattern. Uh, it's again, a poor implementation of the product or of the test, how you are interacting with that particular locator. Changing locators, uh, again, same thing as before. Inspect element reference changes when we migrate. Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by that, uh, Sudha, but again, if it's about the locators changing, it's not a limitation of the page object pattern. In fact, page object pattern will make it easier for you to update the test as uh, these errors are found. And you now have an easy way to refer to or where do you need to make those changes. Parallelization of test cases, uh, says Swapna, no, that's not a page object pattern uh, limitation. That is again a limitation or a poor design of your test automation framework because you have not kept parallel execution as a core criteria of building the framework itself. Naming convention, uh, I don't see why that's a limitation of page objects again, because again, you could name the classes whichever way you want, whether that's a page object or a test name, uh, class name, right? It is uh, completely independent of that. Okay, uh, time does not matter. Multiple classes does not ma matter because our machines are extremely powerful. The minimum we would be having probably as an 8 GB RAM machine, how much time does it take to load a particular class, which is very thin and lightweight. Uh, it does not matter at all. Garbage collection will not clean up that memory very quickly once it goes out of context. Okay, so high time for setup. There is some value in that uh, merits uh, based on what Harish says, because now you need to start thinking about which is a page object over here. This type of interaction, does it belong in this particular page or another page, or do I need to create a new page out of that, right? So that time to set up effort, the thought process is extremely important, but 
thinking before doing is always valuable instead of just implementing something and then figuring out this does not make sense, right? So that is fine. Switching between different pages to handle a functionality, uh, it is not a problem because if it is going between different pages, your flow is going between different pages, it's better to let it handle in that fashion, okay? Common methods in pages, it just means uh, your pages are not well designed. It's not, uh, there should be nothing common in a pages, uh, in different pages. Of course, there will be utility functions. How do I find an element uh, from a page? And that method can be reused by the pages, right? So uh, other than effort, I don't really see a lot of uh, different challenges that are relevant to page object over here, okay? Uh, Nishant has a uh, good point. Sometimes page object is called anti-pattern because it's restricting our views only to page rather than as functionality. Any guidance on this? Definitely, Nishant, we will be talking about this immediately after the limitations of page object pattern. Hold on to that question. Okay. So let's, uh, let me try and tell you my perspective of why page object pattern is, uh, has limitations. As the number of tests grow, we see, uh, that the test intent starts getting polluted. Your test is talking about page interactions, it's talking about UI interactions, instead of focusing on what is the value of the test, what am I really trying to validate as part of this test execution. A bigger problem is as you keep on growing the number of tests, there is going to be a lot of duplication of your test in, uh, implementations across the various different tests. So for example, I want to register a new user and there are different variants of the user, right? Some fields are optional, some fields are mandatory, and you might have different types of tests. Uh, this is a poor example, by the way, but hopefully it conveys the point. There are different tests you will come up with to implement uh, registering of a new user based on these different criteria. Now, what is going to happen? You will end up copy pasting the first test that has been implemented and make some small tweaks to it to get the next test implemented. And that is a very bad idea. Control C, Control V or Command C, Command V should be disabled when you are doing automation, when you are implementing automation. Copy paste does not work. It is going to, it means that you're not thinking about, is there a better design? How I can reuse this functionality? The other thing that happens is your intent becomes uh, imperative. Your test intent that you have uh, specified in your test annotation uh, method, right? it becomes imperative. You're talking about UI actions. You're not focused on the value. And as a result, as your framework grows, as functionality of your product evolves, you're going to have maintenance challenges. How many times have you come across situations where a small change of functionality has meant that a lot of tests have started failing because they need to be updated now because of the UI mapping change. Anyone uh, who has come across those situations, uh, I would take that as a yes uh, and uh, proceed uh, for now. Uh, but also what happens is because of these maintenance challenges, you start facing scaling challenges. You are not able to scale your framework to uh, have more tests, the right types of tests implemented in the correct fashion. And that's where I want to introduce you to another pattern called the business layer page object pattern. What this pattern uh, does, right? If you remember the earlier architecture, this has evolved architecture. So now what we are seeing is a test intent is separated from the business layer or, or the domain functionality. Earlier, it was tied together. Uh, I'll, this is what it was earlier, right? So there was a test intent with everything, functionality and assertions, uh, rules, verifications, everything as part of that. Uh, and that has now evolved to this aspect where the test intent is separate from the business layer domain functionality. And that means my test intent can now focus on purely the business value of that scenario, the business functionality of that scenario that I'm trying to implement, and the implementation of that is there in what I like to call as a business layer, where you are now implementing the domain uh, functionality, and that is where you're doing the assertions and the verifications of that functionality. This business layer is going to talk with your page objects, it will talk with your entities, it will talk with your resources, to make sure the correct data is loaded, configurations are loaded, but you are not confusing that or mixing that up uh, with specifying what your test really is about. The rest of the layers of your code are still remaining the same. Now you might uh, think about this as, but now this is going to create even more classes. 
I really don't care about the number of classes it is going to create in addition. It does not matter. There is no cost in creating that. It helps you structure your thought process better for that matter, instead of having to uh, worry about more classes to be created. Okay. So separating this intent has got a lot of value. And let's see this from a example perspective, what uh, we mean by this. Okay. So now if we look into another example, and here's an example of, I'm now using over here Cucumber. It really does not matter if I'm using a BDD tool or not. What matters is, am I interacting with my product under test in the uh, correct fashion? So over here, I'm talking about, again, these are very trivial examples, but what we are talking about is business functionalities. We're not talking about UI actions or anything. We're talking about business functionalities. These will, uh, if you look at the step files, the step file is now going to uh, talk with, which is a good example. Yeah. So again, because these are just snippets of code, you will see a lot of uh, red or whatever syntax errors over here because it doesn't find those methods. But what we are looking at over here is the test is talking the business language. It is looking at business terminology and this business uh, terminology implemented as part of business layers will do the orchestration with other business operations because it can be a complex business feature that you're talking about, right? I want to transfer money from my account to another account. It's a complex functionality and that itself might have a lot of different business uh, operations to be uh, done in order to achieve that complex functionality. Eventually each business operation is responsible for doing the orchestration with various page objects to do, uh, get that action completed. And the business operation knows if the implementation of that orchestration is successful or not, right? So the assertions will be at the business level, if now business layer and not the page objects. Assertion should never be there in the page objects because a page is a dummy object. It just knows what action to do and what information to get from the page it represents. So now when we have this business operation, you can uh, look at it. Uh, this is what the corresponding methods are going to be for that in the business layers. It will have these business layer methods, which will do the orchestration. And from here, these will call your pages, which are actually doing specific implementations out of it. Okay. Now this is again a poor example of a uh, page object. Why poor? because page objects should never return void. A page object should always return the next page that that action is going to result in. So if I say search for a particular string on Amazon or particular product on Amazon, after searching, I get to a search results page. This is a search page. If my search result is also modeled inside the same page, then I should have returned over here search page itself. And in this case, I would say return this, right? Because I'm returning the same page uh, the result of searching for something. I'm still on the same page. Hence, I'm going to return the same page that is there. However, if this was going to be returning a search results page at this point, I would say return new search results page. And that is what my implementation needs to be. So whoever is calling a page object should always know what is the next page I am going to be on as a result of this operation. The only caveat is in that when it will not return the next page is when I'm looking for information on that particular page. How many search results did I get for this query? So get the number of search results. It's returning to me an integer, a Boolean or a specific data object that I might have created because it's a complex uh, data that I'm uh, retrieving from the page. So I'll use a custom uh, POJO or some custom object to capture that information in, at the page layer and return that. So this could be my uh, product results. And that is an entity that I've created, which is going to have the results of that particular object. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Uh, this example makes sense. So what this means is that my business layer now talks the domain language. 
the test is going to talk with the business layer. Business layer has a domain language. Business layer does the orchestration between the different business operations or pages. Business layer does the assertions and my test remains clean. Okay. So what are the advantages that this gives me? You now start focusing from the test layer. I would never design my page objects first. I always start with thinking, what is my test that I'm want, uh, trying to automate? I will write my test method. Inside the test method, I will do the orchestration of my business operations because that is what is important to me from a test perspective. Everything else is just implementation details. So once I have my test method created with the orchestration of business operations, then I start implementing my business operations, which will do the orchestration between the page objects. Hence my code is lean, it is dry. I will start reusing wherever possible and I'm not unnecessarily creating hundreds of methods or fields in my page objects just because the page has all that functionality. A page may have hundreds of objects or elements that it is uh, working with or representing, but you are going to get only specific uh, implementations done based on what your test requires. When you need additional details to be implemented in your page objects, at that point you would write that. Okay, so validate what is important. The test pyramid starts remaining sane now, right? Because now I'm focused on what is important at top layer of the pyramid. It is about the business functionality and these num uh, tests have to be as uh, few as possible. If I'm talking business terminology, I will not implement the granular test at my UI functional layer. I will think about, can I move it as JavaScript tests, as API tests or API workflow tests? And you'll be able to push the tests which do not really contribute to business value validation at the top layer. I will push those to the lower layers of the pyramid. The abstraction layers, which was already there as part of page object pattern and the new layer uh, that we have introduced, that is going to make it even better for you to have separation of concerns and allow you to uh, reuse a lot of that implementation. The changes hence remain isolated at the business layer as well. It will be isolated uh, structure and hence maintenance and scaling uh, becomes easier. Remember, I'm not saying this is the right solution or this is the best solution, but it will solve a lot of problems for you as your test uh, implementation grows it will be easy to implement, update, uh, maintain scale, and also onboard new team members about what your framework is about. Okay, with uh, quickly into test data patterns, I see there are a lot of questions. I try to get to that as soon as I finish this section. Very interesting questions, but I want to finish off this part quickly. Okay, the way we spoke about the test implementation, similarly, you need to think about test data as well. And the first question I would ask over here is, why do we need to think about data differently? Has anyone ever faced problems when using test data or specifying test data? Okay, I see a comment, uh, a lot of problem related to test data. Why is data uh, a problem? Data is problem, not just uh, one aspect of course is the data changes in the system under test or application under test, hence the test fails. But that is a different problem. In the test implementation itself, that can uh, that becomes a big problem. And why? Because test data itself is very complex. It needs to mimic the real data. And it also needs to be unique in many cases. I cannot create a new user named Anand multiple times. The first time that test will succeed, the next time I'll get an error saying this user already exists in the system. So you need to think about data. What is the data that you are interacting with? How do you mimic that in terms of specifying it in your test? And in many cases, how do you need to make it unique? And you cannot make it unique by modifying the value that you have put in the test and then running it. It defeats the purpose of automation in that case. So how do you implement the uniqueness criteria in your framework to help do that. There could be aspects of data being nested. So for example, as a person as a or as an employee, I could have multiple addresses. An address could be of time home, uh, work or temporary, permanent or whatever types of addresses that could be there. 
address itself is pretty complex, right? A lot of fields over there. Now, if I'm living with my partner and that partner will also have the same address that we are sharing, right? So how do I reuse this data or do I need to duplicate it? There is a lot of aspects uh, in this uh, in case where you need to think about does data need to be nested or data need to be unique or how uh, close to reality it needs to be. And each product has got different criteria around this. So you have to think about it uh, based on that as well. The important aspect when it uh, we spoke about unique, you need to think about uh, this from the aspect that I've specified this as static. I want to register a new user named Anand. But when I'm running the test, I cannot register it as Anand. I need to make that Anand and add a suffix over there to make it unique uh, to make sure the test works deterministically and every time that it is going to run. And more importantly, data can be shared and reused as well. So how do you specify this aspect? So data becomes very complex when it comes to using it in your test framework. And you need to make sure you are able to uh, have a, you have the right strategy for this aspect. So what are the different ways you can specify the data? Okay, one is in the test implementation itself. In that test, uh, as part of the test method, uh, you would say, okay, I'm registering a uh, user Anand. That is one aspect. Or rather, uh, this is when I'm actually in my page object, I would say that uh, I'm always going to have my password as password, for example, right? I've hard coded the data inside, deep inside the test. Second is I could have it at the test method level where it is going to get passed from the intent to the lowest layer of interaction with the page where it is actually going to be passed to the page. Third is in code itself. I can have separate data structures or classes or enums with data created, whatever different structures that you want, but it is in code, but it is just stored separately from your actual implementation logic, but it is there in code. That is another approach of storage. Or it could be there in external files. I already see uh, some aspects about uh, how uh, it could be stored in files, right? So let's quickly list out those different ways that you can have it. You could have it in Excel, definitely something that I would never use. Uh, I just have a strong dislike uh, for uh, Excel in that sense. There are better ways to specify the data, which is closer to the code. Uh, and you can look at that uh, data very quickly. CSV is still better from that fashion because in code itself, I can open it up in the same ID and uh, proceed. But there are various different options, property files, XML, YAML, database, JSON, and there could be many other aspects in terms of specifying uh, the data, okay? So let's look at some examples of how we could use the data in our you know, code. Now in this case, Here's an example of in the test itself, right? Where I'm specifying data or directly in the uh, code category is this, whatever uh, that I want, right? I could specify it over here. Or if I look at a Java example, I'm saying uh, I'm hard coding the locator over here, for example, right? Uh, or that uh, data over here is specified, hard coded inside the test. Uh, that is uh, one way of doing it. The external files. In this case, I'm going to uh, read some files. So I'll get a particular input file name. I'll uh, read that file. And based on that file uh, data that is read, I'm going to use uh, that aspect, uh, the uh, data over there. That is another way of doing this. Third is from config files. So I've got uh, data over here based on various different environments, for example, right? Which data to use in that environment. And I'll be able to load that uh, in my test and use that. The third case is in my test, depending how complex it really needs to be, right? I'm saying in my test, which type of entity do I want to load from which particular section of the uh, external file? And do I want to randomize it or not before using it in the test? This is a very complex case. Hopefully you never need to use some anything like this. So if I say contact info individual one, so there's some hard coded data that is here, but in the test itself, I'm saying when I use individual one, I want you to randomize certain aspects of this data before actually using it in the test. 
So this gives you an aspect of for a lot of data to be specified, you will still specify the bare minimum and then you will randomize that data before actually implementing it in the test. Now, why is this aspect important? It all comes down to what is required from the context of your test. It all depends, comes down to that aspect. What is it that you're trying to test? What are the constraints of the product under test? And how do you manage that? But the main point in my uh, opinion is, once you understand all these aspects, how can you make your tests run completely independently without requiring any manual intervention as many number of times that you need to run the test? I never want to touch the test just because the data has changed. I need to make that aspect very seamless. So I could implement it once and the test will run hundreds of times in CI and I don't have to worry about some aspect of data not being unique or it failing because of that, right? Uh, I don't want to do that. And that's the aspect that you need to think about building into the framework. Okay. So the criteria for selection, which is a format that you would use. First thing, it has to be easy to specify. It has to be easy to read and consume by the test framework. You need to think about, I don't want to do complex manipulations to create the data structure or format uh, in the format that is required for you to be able to use that in the implementation. So it has to be ready to uh, uh, easy to read and consume. It should be able to override the specified data easily if that is a requirement from your product perspective. This is not a test requirement or a test implementation requirement. It is a constraint from your application under test. Based on that constraint, you need to have a solution from a test implementation perspective to allow a direct use. And most importantly, it has to be usable. Okay. So once it is usable, you will be able to use this data in an effective fashion to proceed. What are the, uh, some tips to implement? So think about consistent way to specify the test data. Read the data as business entities. Don't think about it. So if I'm searching for a book on Amazon, it has the book has got a certain criteria or certain attributes around it. If you specify the same attributes for your test data as well, there's an easy mapping and correlation in terms of understanding what is the data that you're using and how does it affect or relate to the application under test. Override as app appropriate, create DSS to give meaningful, uh, to give meaning to that data. That is very important. Uh, don't uh, have implementation details there, but a domain specific language to say uh, what it really means. Use it appropriately in the implementation and also implement functionalities as uh, build or equals or copy or find based on what you really need to do in terms of uh, using that data. Okay. Last bit, locators which is again a big thing, right? You can specify locators in various different fashions, either directly in the page object or in separate files per page object or in a separate file, all of them clubbed together and uh, with some marker for uh, different page objects. So all these options are possible. Okay. What is a better option? It really depends on you. My first choice is always going to be keep the locators in the same page object where it is going to be used. It is okay if that same locator value is there in other pages as well. That's a small uh, bit of duplication, which is an intentional choice, but at least it gives you an understanding if a particular page is changing, you know where to go and make that change in one place itself. Okay. So what are the advantages of using patterns for test automation? One, it is well known and well understood. I didn't need to tell you about page object pattern. You, uh, if I'm saying these are the snippets of pages, you know exactly what that means immediately. So it is well known and well understood. It is a tried and tested solution for common problems, it reduces complexity. These are language neutral. I showed you different examples, uh, uh, different programming language examples. It didn't uh, make a difference in the concept which I was trying to highlight or the problems or challenges or advantages I was trying to highlight because the, it is across languages, it does not matter. It is language neutral and it aids in communication as well, right? It makes it easy to understand and you can get to the core uh, topic of uh, what you're trying to explain to someone else with that uh, pattern name. So advantages, it's single ownership to do what is required now, uh, what that pattern is saying, single point of change. It saves a lot of time and effort. Eventually, initially, there is a lot of effort to make sure you're designing it in the correct way, 
separate uh, separation of concerns is there implementation is done correctly so initially there is a lot of work but once you get the hang of what is it that you are trying to implement then it just goes like a breeze it's a repeat of what you have done makes it very easy hence it makes it easy to implement maintain debug and scale as well and most importantly remember test automation code should be as production quality of production quality in fact it should be better than production quality because it's testing what is going out in production so make sure your test code is uh, sane it is going to uh, it is doing the right thing and that will help you validate the functionality of your product as well right so which is the best pattern to use whether for implementation or locators or data what is the right answer is there a right answer what do you think which is the best pattern to use all combination whatever fits the bill right you are right it depends it depends on the context the context is extremely extremely important to understand and the context is about the product under test uh, how it is going to evolve the skills of the team members what tech stack is being used what is the future plan for the product uh, does it need to run in parallel or not which should not really be a question should it be running in ci or not that should also not really be a question but really it's about is it doing what it is supposed to do and will it help us continue to do the same thing give us quick feedback with um, confidence with determinism as the product scales and evolves over time right so choose the right set of patterns combination of patterns which is going to help solve these uh, question uh, problems for you okay so here are a lot of references uh, that i have the slides will be shared uh, the video is also being recorded it will be shared with everyone so uh, not to worry about that aspect there were some questions around that so uh, there is a question okay so now before i get into the questions i want to uh, announce the winner of the challenge that uh, we had shared so very happy to say uh, virender singh uh, congratulations uh, i know he was unwell uh, in the recent past hope you are feeling well but congratulations on winning the challenge and uh, um, this project team will be in uh, touch with you uh, for the next steps around that but thank you for participating and um, well done so let's get into questions okay uh, i'm going to try and go through the chat comments and see what questions are there uh, first i'll go through the q and a section itself how to define design pattern for web mobile and api do we need these to be defined separately or as a single framework santosh the answer is it depends ideally the tests are as close to the product code that is uh, there which means the developers will be able to take a look at it they'll be able to run the test as quickly as possible and they'll be able to contribute to implementing more tests as well but depending on the context of the application under test what types of tests you are writing so if you are doing end to end testing or integration testing then you probably need a separate repo where you will have api workflow tests and end to end functional automation tests also implemented together as part of that but keeping the functional and api workflow test together will be very helpful because eventually you will be able to start getting value of the api test to do some setup type of activities and then use the ui to drive that application under test uh, to in, uh, make your test feedback faster okay so hope that answers the next one is what's the best approach uh, to define locators in case uh, multiple page objects must use the same element you said that you actually prefer to define the elements for each page separately again uh, so the question uh, is interesting but the answer is again it depends in this case without knowing really the application under test it is difficult to answer that question if it should be in the same place or not as i said the point to start off with i always keep the locators in the same page object as where uh, that page functionality is implemented it makes it easier to reuse and change but now what are the aspects of these locators that need to be common across the pages why are they common is that an opportunity to refactor a snippet of a page itself have those locators as part of that page and then using composition patterns you are, you can uh, bring that as part of the different pages that are there so maybe that is a way to think about it 
Okay. Uh, next question. Will Mocha Chai test uh, with POM uh, work effectively on GitLab pipeline, not causing test to be flaky? I think Mocha Chai, I've not used it much, but uh, if I'm not mistaken, these are runners that are there. Page object model is how you want to structure your test implementations to make it easy to understand, reuse, and scale as well. So I don't see a reason why it should not be able to be reused or uh, implemented along with uh, Mocha Chai as well. How do you reduce uh, effort on spending in object maintenance? Well, it's about test strategy. Am I picking up the right test for implementation in the first place? That is a question to ask. It doesn't mean that only when the UI is stable, then I'll implement it. It all comes down to your test design, test strategy, when to implement and how to implement it. But the point is whatever you implement, keep the dry principle in mind, keep the aspect of single uh, uh, responsibility principle in mind. And that way you'll be able to uh, avoid a lot of changes in many different places. Okay. There's another question since you're using JavaScript, I suggest looking at Gage and Taiko. With Taiko, you can use relative locators, for example, uh, text box relative to some text or another HTML element. Of course, there are so many different programming languages, tools, uh, frameworks that are available. Choose the right, choosing the right tech stack or tool set is a very important aspect of uh, implementation as well. So you have to bear in mind all different parameters before you say this is the right thing to be chosen or not. But look at all these aspects, uh, they will add value. For that matter, Selenium 4, which has Alpha 7 has been released now, also has got a lot of very interesting features. So that's also not a bad option. But again, it comes down to, is that the right tech stack and tool set for me and uh, proceed uh, accordingly. Okay. Uh, there are still a lot of questions. Uh, Mithal, please feel free to jump in when we need to stop. But otherwise, I'll keep going at... Uh, we still have a few moments, uh, maybe like another one or two minutes, um, but then I guess we can continue this uh, okay. over our account. Sure, sounds good. Uh, so how do you separate elements uh, from interactions with them on different classes using page object pattern? Does it lead to cleaner code? Separate elements from interactions with them. No, the elements and the interactions with those elements probably belong to the same page itself, right? If I need to get uh, what is the text that I've entered in a field, I need that element and the interaction with that element in that same page. So I, that probably goes uh, together. Okay. How do you reduce effort on object maintenance? We spoke about that. How to stand out as a quality assurance automation engineer, learn patterns and use patterns effectively. Sorry, that's not a complete answer, but the question is a little vague as well. So I'm going to move on from that one. Why data needs to be unique? It doesn't need to be if your product doesn't uh, require that to happen. But tell me this, if you need to sign up for a Gmail account and if I have an email account, anand.gmail.com, can I create another email account with the same name, anand.gmail.com? It's as simple as that. That's the reason why if you are need to do a sign up of a new user uh, account as a test, automated test, I will need to make sure I don't repeat the same username every time. Otherwise, the second time itself, the test is going to be failing, right? So that's why data needs to be unique. For that, you need to spend time understanding your product. What are the constraints? What are the criteria? And don't just test or implement tests superficially. That is going to be very important. Okay. Are these uh, patterns working uh, I, same for single page application? For now? Can you hear me? Uh, sorry, okay. but uh, we ran out of time, but... Um, Thank you so much. This is valuable information. I'm sure all of you will agree with me, everyone that's with us. Uh, There's so many interesting questions we had here. And Anand, thank you so much for this wonderful webinar. Um, and, and thank you everyone thank for you. joining this event. Um, I've also shared my LinkedIn profile and announced profile in the chat. So if you'd like to continue chatting, feel free. And also a link to our YouTube channel. So you will be the first to get notified once the webinar recording is live. Um, Anand, do you have uh, anything else to say to our uh, viewers, to the audience? No, uh, just a couple of things. First of all, thank you so much for making this so interactive. Um, uh, it almost made me feel like uh, this is a live conference or a live uh, talk, right? So thank you very much for that aspect. And secondly, uh, lastly, rather for that matter, I hope everyone continues to remain safe in these difficult times. 
and hopefully see you all face to face at some point soon. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anand. It was a true pleasure. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. See you in the next one.